Okay, so number 10 in the applications. Oh, good, it's a hypothesis test. All right, so I did one like this yesterday or the day before, so I'm just gonna try a similar problem to start over. And uh, I have, every once in a while, you'll see these blue sections that say, hey, these are the formulas you need. Okay, so in this section, we're doing hypothesis tests, and you're either gonna use a t-distribution for a mean or a normal distribution for a proportion. So which one do we have here, mean or a proportion? 10. All right, let me copy this, I think. And the question is, yeah, what's the test statistic? So let's go down that far. Notebook. Got a little jumbled up here, so let's pull it up one more time. All right, so many investors and financial analysts believe the Dow Jones Industrial Average gives a good barometer, so kind of a, a you know, what's the weather like on the start, stock market? Uh, on January 31st, nine in 2006, nine of the 30 stocks making up the Dow Jones increased in price, according to the Wall Street Journal. All right, so let's start a new paragraph here. Uh, on the basis of this fact, the financial analyst claims that we can assume 30% of the stocks traded on the New York Stock Exchange went up the same day. Okay. A sample of 79 stocks traded on the New York Stock Exchange that day showed that 37 went up. Uh, you were to conduct a study. Oops. to see if the proportion of stocks that went up is significantly more than 0.3 or 30%. And then we have our significance level, and then we want to know what the test statistic, that's a tongue twister, for the sample is. All right, so we got a, this is, so what do we have here, a mean or a proportion? Well, uh, I don't see the word average anywhere, so it looks like it's not a mean. And they're saying there's nine out of 30, so they're giving me here a proportion. Um, and then here they talk about 30%, which is okay. So all over the place, I'm getting like proportion, proportion, proportion. So this sentence right here, financial analyst claims that we can assume that 30%. So he's not saying more than 30, less than 30, he's saying 30%. So this sentence right here says P, equals 0 0.3, oops, my pen is having a little delay, 0 0.3. Uh, that right there has to be the null hypothesis because it has an equal to in it. Uh, we have some sample information here. So this is my N and this would be my X. And so together those give me my P prime, which is always X over N. So whatever 37, over 79 is, we'll throw that in a spreadsheet in a moment. And then we're conducting, this, uh, conducting a study to see if the proportion of stocks that went up is significantly more. Okay, so significantly more is saying, uh, we think that the proportion is actually more than 30%. Since this doesn't have an equal to, equal to it, this must be the alternative hypothesis, H1 or HA, whatever you wanna call it. Okay, so up here is my H0. And here's my HA. Uh, so here we get to do a p-value. Uh, we need to make this calculation here. We're also gonna need the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. And that's going to be p times q over n inside the square root. So for us, that would be the 30% from the null. Q is always one minus that, so that would be 70%. And then divide by the sample size, 79 and take the square root of that whole thing. So we need that number, that's the average spread here. And the center is gonna be the 30%. So I'll get my picture in a second. So test statistics, so a sample statistic is like the uh, P prime or the X bar. 
that's a sample statistic. A test statistic is either a z-score for us or a t-score. So in this case, since I have a proportion, I have to use z-scores. And a z-score is always the, the number from the sample minus the number from the population. So that would be p prime minus p divided by the standard deviation, which is over here. So in this case, it'd be the square root of p q over n. So I need that number to calculate the z-score. Uh, and that's the z-score based on the sample. And usually we compare that to the z-score based on the significance level which is similar to comparing a p-value to the significance level. So I'll draw that out in my picture, but I need this calculation first. So as far as which spreadsheet to use, if you were going to use one of the pre-built ones, I guess I could use that one. We are doing a hypothesis test, so I would, if you don't already have this stashed away somewhere, I recommend you do rather than going back here over and over again have this somewhere in your drive where you can repeatedly reaccess it. And here, for some reason, I put it in as a, a, um, an Excel sheet instead of a Google Doc. So if you're a Excel user, download it in the upper right. If you're a Google user, then open it with Google Sheets. And somewhere in my drive, I already have a copy of this. So I probably should go look for that instead. Uh, and then what are we doing here? Are we doing a Z test for a mean, a T test for a mean, or a proportion test? And the answer is we're doing the proportion test. So this is the, the tab you would work in there. And let's see, where's my Google Drive? Over here, hypothesis tests. Should be somewhere in my recents. Here's my copy of it. So then I could just plug in my information here and get the calculations I need. So again, I want the proportion is what I'm testing here. And hey, look at that, it, it's got the 0.3, which is the one I'm doing here. And it even has the greater than, which is my alternative hypothesis, cool. Um, and I deleted the picture over there because usually once you change the data, it's not relevant anymore. And this one's not gonna be com completely relevant because I have different numbers. So it was mine 37 out of 79, I think. So type the right numbers in. So according to this, oh, and then my significance level changed. That was two tenths of a percent. So let me double check that. Yeah, two tenths of a percent there. Okay, so um, I don't think this spreadsheet, oh, come on, zoom, move out of the way. Where did you go? Over here. Let's close that and that. Um, oh, there is a place for the test statistic. Oh, wait a minute. I think I added that later. Um, yeah, that wasn't in the original one. So I guess I should put a place for a test statistic in there. So let's do that now. So I'm going to edit the original one. Let's see, I don't think I see it here. Sample statistics, but we don't have the test statistics, so we go wrong sheet. And my Zoom tools are always in the way somewhere. Um, sample size, sample proportion. Yeah, so to get the test statistic, we need that uh, standard error here. So I'll squeeze it in right here. So test statistic, which is, let's so use the next cell, a Z score right here. And that's always going to be equal to parentheses, the sample proportion minus the, oops, and this doesn't have the right numbers, I'll have to fix that, uh, population proportion, which is from the null, divided by the standard error, which is calculated right here. And then I just need to plug in the right numbers, so this should be a, oh, now I'm editing the original one. Oops, oh well, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, Three. Yeah, 
and then 37. And we'll get a graph from stack Q2 for fun. And that was 79. I better double check those. 37 out of 79. Yep. And where am I right here? Okay, so my sample proportion is about 46.8%. My standard error is about 5%, starting at 30%. So I'm gonna make a sketch of this. And the z-score is 3.3-ish, which is way out to the left. So this might be an unusual event. It depends on the p-value. Let's see, or right out to the right, sorry. Uh, that's a positive z-score. And then is this a left tail, right tail, two tail? And going up here, it's supposed to be P is greater than was our alternative. So that means it's a right tail. Test. So that would be this point zero, 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 five. And I was given an alpha of zero, zero, two, if I remember right. Yep. All right, so let's put this in a picture and see what the hell is going on. So let's see, I need to double check one thing. What was the proportion? 46.8-ish. Uh, okay, and the standard error is about 0.5 or 5%. Sorry, I misspoke. And I'm kind of running out of room there. Let's go to a new page. So this is a graph of the oops, proportion of stocks that went up. Proportion of stocks that increased in value. And again, remember our null hypothesis is that it's believed based on that one day's evidence that it should be 30%. And we have an alternative based on some other data that says, ah, we think it might be greater than 30%. And we're using alpha as 0 0.002, which as a percent, which would be two tenths of a percent. So that's the information about the test. Then we have the sample information and the sample had said, I'm just summarizing what we've done so far, that P prime is 37 over 79, which works out to be, what was that again, 46.8% roughly? 46.8, yeah. To three decimal places, so I rounded there. Uh, so, oh, and then I need the standard error. The standard error here was approximately 5%. So drawing a picture of what's going on, this is a hypothesis test. So the mean is the mean from the, uh, in this case, proportion from a null. So 30% goes in the middle. And then again, usually with a, oops, it's kind of too far out. We usually go like one, two, three standard deviations on each side, because according to the Empirical rule, that's about 99.5% of, of the data lives within three standard deviations. So like this right here would be a z-score of zero because we're right in the middle. This would be a z-score of one, two, and three. We calculated that this sample based on the null and the standard error has a z-score of about, what was it, 3.3-ish? Uh, yeah, about 3.3. So that means, uh, what book? Okay. that our sample data lives way out here. So right about here would be a z-score of about 3.3, right? 3.3 standard deviations to the right. If we count standard deviations here, uh, going by 0.5, then this number right here, which is green, would be 30% plus 5% or about 35%. At another 0.5, this would be about 40%. And right here, another 5%, sorry, I keep saying 0.5, that's wrong. This would be about 45%. And our sample data, let's go back to blue, 
this is my p prime right there. That is 0.4, oops, 468. Right? And you can see, right, that's more than three standard deviations to the right. That's what this z-score told us. So this z-score is what we refer to as the, the test statistic. Test statistic. And this p prime, the 0.486, that is the sample statistic. Sample statistic. There's uh, another number called a critical value, which is based on the alpha. So let me throw that here. Um, so given that alpha equals 0 0.002, we can calculate a z-score to go with that. So the z-score for uh, our alpha would be that norm inverse formula we used before. And it says um, use point the alpha value as a decimal, and then z-score is always a mean zero, standard deviation of one. So the z-score associated with that, it's gonna give me a negative, but I want the positive version because this is a right tail test. Go out to my spreadsheet. And let's see where was alpha up here. Yeah, so this would be z alpha, and that is equal to the inverse and dot, no, no, not inverse of alpha 0 0.002 comma 0 comma 1. And it's going to give me the negative version. I want the positive one because it's a right tail test. So this says if, if your data has a z-score above 2.878, then that's unusual for this significance level. And our z-score was 3.3-ish, so it is above that. Uh, and again, since this is a right tail test, I actually want the positive version so I can sneak in and change the sign by multiplying by negative one. Uh, and this number right here is called the critical value, and it's always based on the significance level. Critical value. And so it's about 2.88-ish, and I went to two decimal places. So over here, that's about 2.88. So if we take the significance level and we find the associated z-score, that z-score is called a critical value. And it's kind of saying drawing a line in the sand. So let's do a dotted line for that. So that would be about right here. So that's one standard deviation, two standard deviations, three, 2.88 standard deviations would be about here. So that's the line in the sand such that 0.2% uh, of other samples fall out here to the right. And the, again, the z-score that goes with that is that z equals 2.88. So, so we, the significance level draws a line in the sand and we say if our sample data falls in the outside region, it's unusual, meaning that the null hypothesis, we should reject it. Uh, but how, if your sample data falls inside this region, then it's like, eh, close enough. So in this case, we have two pieces of evidence. One piece of evidence is that our test statistic is bigger than the z-score, and bigger than is important here because it's a right tail test. And the other important piece of evidence is that our p-value, which we calculated on the spreadsheet, to be quite small right here, uh, that would be what? Five hundredths of a percent, so 0 0.005. So let's put that in there too. So we have two pieces of evidence that say reject the null. The p-value, so here's our test statistic, right? The 46.8%. The p-value is the percent of other samples of size 79 that, that might be bigger than that. So my p-value, 0 0.0005 roughly. Uh, and in this case, it is less than alpha, so definitely reject null. Okay, should, so we got a couple other questions. Should we write down some interpretations of this? So far we just did calculations and I just spoke what some things meant. Would you like to see in writing, like a conclusion and an interpretation?
Okie doke, let's write it up. So rejecting the null is just a decision, right? So that's my decision. I tell my mom, hey mom, I'm rejecting the null. She's like, what the hell are you talking about? So now I have to put that in the context for this problem. So, uh, and then I'll try to explain what the p-value means. So, no, not that button, I want a new page. Okay, so we're gonna write a conclusion here. for rejecting the null, which means we get to accept that the alternative seems to be true. Do we know the alternative is true? The answer is no, we do not. We just have a chance that it's true, but we could have made a mistake. And the p-value kind of relates to the mistake. Um, so does the significance level more likely though. Um, let's see, we have sufficient evidence. because we're rejecting uh, that the proportion, proportion of stocks that increased in value. So I have to have a firm understanding of what my parameter is. And my parameter was the proportion of stocks that increased in value on a given day. So I got to write that in here. So the proportion of stocks that increased in value on, let's say this day, whatever this day is, is more than, so now I'm stating the alternative hypothesis, 30%. Um, So I need to say about it. We have sufficient evidence that the proportion of stocks that increased in value on this day is more than 30%. Yeah, that's our conclusion. Um, can we say the proportion of stocks that went up is 46.8%? The answer is no, we can't state that. We would have to run a confidence interval and give a range of values and a margin of error. We don't have any of that here. That's a whole nother set of calculations we did not complete. Uh, often in the research, they'll state their conclusion and they might also state the p-value. So I might make a little note, p-value is about 0 0.0005. And, and researchers go like, ooh, wow, yeah, that's small. Okay, something's wrong with your null hypothesis. The sample data indicates um, that something's changed. So that's my conclusion. Um, another thing that I sometimes ask about is what does the p-value mean? So that would be interpretation of the p-value. And the interpretation depends on the test that you're doing. It's worded slightly different depending on whether it's a left tail or a right tail or a two tail test. So interpretation of p-value of that small number. Okay, so there is a, and I'm gonna state it as a decimal. So five hundredths of a percent, right? To change a decimal to a percent, you shift the decimal twice because you're multiplying by 100%. So there is a five hundredths percent chance of finding another sample of 79 stocks all right, the sample size for which more than 48.6%, right? That was my sample proportion went up in value. When we were expecting only 30% to go up in value. And why do I need that last part? I'll show you. Expecting only 30%. And putting the word only in there is kind of biased because I'm rejecting the null. Uh, I could do without it. Uh, we were expecting only 30% to go up in value. So again, this is my p-value here. The p-value is related to the sample size, the sample statistic, and the null hypothesis because if, oops, wrong page, if we look back at our picture here, the 
uh, percent is only this far to the right because I put 30% in the middle, right? If 35 was in the middle, then this wouldn't be as far out and it would be like, oh, no big deal. Um, but because we put 30% in the middle the and then there's a size 79 uh, sample, uh, those kind of two pieces together make 46.8 way out to the right, more than three standard deviations to the right, which is typically pretty unusual, uh, meaning something's wrong with the claim that it should be 30% because this data indicates that it's much larger. Okay. So the, so the, the significance level and the p-value kind of say, how unusual is it to find a sample like this when we're expecting something else to happen? Okay, uh, if it's a good random sample, then it's most likely the case that the null hypothesis was wrong. Is there a chance we made a mistake that we rejected the null, but the null is true, and this is really just a weird sample? The answer is yes. That's what alpha tries to measure, the, the chance of making that thing called a type one error, that we rejected the null when we shouldn't have. Because that could be the case, my data could be wrong. I don't know. All right, so those are the big interpretations that you need to know about. Um, what, what does the decision to reject the null mean in this situation? Um, and notice I try to avoid things like null hypothesis and reject or fail to reject. Um, but I did use the phrase significant evidence or sufficient evidence. Um, and so I'm trying to like balance it between talking to a science type, type person and talking to my mom. Um, and then uh, the interpretation of the p-value is like, where did that, five hundredths of a percent come from. So I'm explaining where that came from here based on the sample and what the parameter means in this case. All right, let's do another one. So we got that one nailed, I think. I don't feel the need to plug in the numbers on that. And then you get to think about which is the right one to pick here. And these are tricky because the language is twisted and there's double negatives in there. And usually I have to really think hard about which one to pick, even though I know what the right conclusion should be. Um, and these always twist my mind and I get these wrong sometimes because the double negatives screw me up. So good luck picking that conclusion there. Uh, I would rather write my own. And on the final exam, uh, on, the, on the, the sample I have you pick, but on the final you'll actually have to write this out for me like I just did. So there'll be a few problems where I have to grade your written responses. And then some of it will be graded automatically. All right, uh, let's see. There was a question about uh, number 12 or number nine in the review. Okay, let's go take a look. Let's stop this recording. I've rambled quite a bit there.